John Ramirez never doubted that there's life after death. As a satanic priest, he knew he was going to hell when he died. And that was fine with him until he took a trip there and came face to face with the devil himself. John Ramirez grew up in the Bronx, where his relatives practiced Santeria. My father's side came from a family of witches and warlocks. My father was very heavy into Santeria, very heavy into spiritualism. John longed for a relationship with his dad, but his father was abusive. There was no love, there was no compassion. We watched him beat my mother in, in house. He came in drunk most of the time, uh, demanding stuff, asking for stuff. If things wasn't done a certain way, it was always put down, hurtful words, dummy, stupid, you're going to amount to nothing, that kind of stuff. I would just stand by the door and look and see what he was up to because I was looking to see if there was time for me. Just to have an interaction, right? we did something, my dad and I did something. But he was connected to the demons, he was connected to spiritualism. John's mother was also influenced by Santeria. At his aunt's suggestion, she took John to a tarot card reading. The lady sent the cards. I had 30 days to do the ceremony or I would be blind. So my mother, as a good mother, didn't want nothing to happen to her son, so we did it. They blindfolded me, did a bath for me with herbs, and they started chanting and calling the five main god demons from Santeria. From that moment, John's life changed. My whole personality, everything who I stand for as a young boy, was no longer there. I felt like someone took a black blanket and just put it right over me, spiritually. I was an answering not only to my mom and my dad, but I was answering to the demons. John's involvement with Santeria deepened quickly. I was being taught and trained with high-ranked devil worshippers into spiritualism. I went to sinking into funerals, acting like I knew the person that died because I wanted to buy the soul of that person that died because I can get that soul and put it on somebody and die the same way. When drug dealers got killed in the street, I wanted to run out and get the blood because I can use that human blood to do witchcraft. For the first time in his life, John felt powerful and respected. People knew that I was a force to be reckoned with. I liked that power. I was talked down to as a young boy. Now I had the authority and the power that I can do whatever I want. When John was 13, his father was murdered in a bar fight. John gave credit to the devil for relieving his mother's suffering. I'd be up at 5 in the morning calling out to God saying, help my mother, and no one showed up. But the devil showed up because he killed my dad. I believe the devil said, well, no one loves you, but I love you. Your father can't provide for you, but I, I, I'm your provider. The devil said to me, uh, do, do, the, do the religion. I give you anything you want. Just ask. John says Satan became the father he never had. John was devoted to him. I light up my candles, I spit the rum, I spit the cigar smoke, the cigar smoke means power. If I didn't have money for a roost, I cut myself and use my own blood and pour it in. The whole atmosphere of the room changes. And you know there's something there. And then when it's there, you have to dress him like a family member. My father, I'm here. What would you like to speak to me about? What is it that you want me to do? As time went on, John also practiced the dark arts outside his apartment. He preyed on Christians in particular. At the clubs, I would go around looking for Christians. And I knew that in the club, you was in the devil's playground. So I knew that if I can get into it and you had a beer to already in your system, I knew all I had to do was just say, listen, I have something to tell you today. And right now you will open the door and you said, what is it you need to tell me? You gave me gateway. Eventually, John became a high priest in Palo Mayambe, a form of African spiritualism. As he became more powerful, John took warfare seriously. The devil told me that I had to go into the neighborhood in the spirit round in order to weaken it in the natural. Whatever you kill in the spirit round, you can kill in the natural. So I will leave my body home and I should project myself into different boroughs, different regions, different states, different countries. And as I followed the neighborhood, I would speak curses into the neighborhood, speak things that I wanted to happen into the neighborhood. Sometimes I will go into neighborhoods and I see this group of people in the spirit in the corner praying, holding hands, heads bowed, praying up a storm. And there was no accomplishment in that neighborhood. That neighborhood was sanctified, blessed, 
to pray. There was, you couldn't touch it. But the other neighborhoods, it was party time. Around that time, John met a girl who intrigued him. I said, well, you know, I can hang out with her. She's good looking, and she invited me to church. She also invited John to meet her parents, who talked to him about Jesus. They had the Bible out. Hey, listen, we want to talk to you about this. I'm like, oh, I can't come to the house. Your parents are crazy. I said, at least let me digest the food, and then you can talk about this Jesus guy. And then after I leave her, I will go to worship. I will go to the double church and kill animals all night long. And then I will come back and see her, but she didn't know. John found the Christians amusing and harmless. We had a different system that they had. Their stuff was just kisses, hallelujah, we love you. So I kept coming to church to please her, but I wasn't going to leave people I was committed to. One Sunday morning, the pastor gave an altar call. John went forward, but wasn't prepared for what happened next. I said, well, the devil can't touch me here. I'm in front of the pastor now. I'm protected. All of a sudden, I got demon possessed. I grabbed them by the throat, picked them up in there, and said, I came for you. And all these big men came out to see, try to grab me. I was just throwing people around like rag dolls. And then 200 something people got up and raised up hands. Spiritual warfare for a person that would have killed them on a heartbeat. I saw the power of God in the church. One of the guys was whispering back in my ear and say, say Jesus is Lord, say Jesus is Lord, say it, say it. So I couldn't open my mouth. And then Jesus suddenly I was able to say, Jesus is, Lord. Jesus is Lord. And the devil left. John was embarrassed about the outburst, but not sure what to do next. One of the church elders approached him a few days later. He said, Jesus wants you to have this. He gave me a sweatshirt. They said, you're a warrior for Christ. For someone to come and say, this is a gift in Christ, because he's loved you. To me, that was amazing. I couldn't believe that Jesus loved me. But I was committed to the dark side. I was committed to the demons. I was committed to the devil. And I was between two worlds. One night, John decided to end the struggle between the two worlds the only way he knew how. I said, boy, if Jesus can't have me, the devil can't have me, the best way out of suicide. In my ignorance, in my shame, in my, in my mind that was so far gone, spiritually drained, very spiritually drained. John didn't know how to pray, but he began to talk to God. I don't know what they call you, Jesus, whatever they call you in church. I don't like you. I never liked you. I, ne I never had nothing to do with you. I want no dealings with you. I hate you. I don't want to be part of you. I, don't want to, I never want to be a Christian. I disown you. If that's going to get you away from me, I will worship the devil to the day I die. I whisper saying, if you are bigger than the God that I serve, then you show me tonight or leave me alone. John went to sleep and dreamed he was on a subway. The train was filled with people and the faces was drained, and we were going somewhere that I know that was not good. And as the train was going faster than light, there was a lady dressed very elegant, and she started talking to me in demonic tongues. I understood the tongue, traitor, you're leaving us. So I try to get into the middle of the train, in the middle of the people, so she won't reach me. Pop hit, and the doors opened, I ended up in hell. John stepped out of the subway and into the darkness. As I went to the tunnels of hell, the heat it wasn't a heat that you feel on earth. It grips you, and the fear ropes around you. There's no hope. The hope is removed. As I got to a part of the tunnel, the devil came out, bigger and more strong. I've never seen him like that. And he said to me, I've been with you since you were nine years old. I've been a father to you. I've given you everything. He said, I'm going to keep you here, but if I can keep you here, you won't wake up upstairs which is on earth. And he said, You belong to me, and you're not gonna leave. You know too many secrets about my religion. And when he went to grab me, to snuff me, this three foot cross appeared in my hands. I couldn't understand how a cross would appear in my hands. I never called for the cross. I put it on the devil. And he felt like nothing. He felt like he was a, a baby. No powers at the foot of the cross. When John woke up, he was a changed man. And I knew that Jesus was the Lord. 
I bend my knee to the cross. And Jesus came into my life. I took a white piece of paper and I wrote down a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. I serve you all the days of my life. John threw out all of his witchcraft paraphernalia, but the battle wasn't over. He was under spiritual attack every night for the next month. At night, I felt a presence coming to the room. And then when I would turn around, I would actually sometimes see what was there. Or sometimes I would just slip around and somehow fall asleep up this way, and I would just feel someone's hands just grab me by my throat and try to pick me off of bed and try to rip my body, I rip my soul out of my body. Sometimes they grab by my feet and the bed would shake and it would bring it up and levitate the bed and levitate me to the point that I was, sometimes I might even reach the ceiling and I couldn't breathe and I couldn't cry out. I couldn't talk. I felt like I was choking. I felt like they were choking the life out of me and I would try to call out for Jesus and the words wouldn't come out. And then in the end of the words, come out, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Saves me. And it would go away. John didn't understand why God permitted the nightly struggles. I asked the Lord, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why this torment? Why did you allow these people to abuse me this way? I gave my life to you. I told you I would serve you. And he said to me, I wanted to know how much you love me, how much you trust me. And no devil ever showed up to my house ever again. John says he wouldn't trade anything for what he's found in Christ. For 25 years of my life, I was able to do anything to anybody, anyway. I count that out to be foolish. To gain Christ. He's my own all. He's the breath I breathe. He walks with me. I can hear the sound of his voice in my ear. Today, John shares the gospel with everyone he can. He has written a book about his experiences called Out of the Devil's Cauldron. I've been victorious in Christ. I got peace. I'm not empty no more. I got fulfillment. I got a purpose and I have a destiny today. And all because I said yes to the cross. And I am evangelist for the kingdom of light. No more an evangelist for the dark side. I expose the dark side every time the Lord gives me a chance because we don't have to die in your sins. You don't have to shed blood like in Palamanyumbe. Jesus shed the blood for you. That's the blood that counts, the one at the cross. When I do go, they don't have to worry about me. Dying is easy, living is hard. There's someone out there that needs to know that heaven is a real place God is a real person, and when you take that last breath, if you're a Christian, you're going to meet him. And when you take that last breath, if you're a Christian, you'll meet him. Freddie's story seems incredible, but at the same time, it mirrors exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul and how Paul recorded his experience. In the book of Acts, it speaks of him being taken outside of a city and stoned and left for dead. And then the disciples gathered around him and prayed, and he was revived and sprang up and went back into that same city to preach the good news. And he wrote about his experience. He wrote about a man, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. But he was taken up to heaven and shown things that it's not lawful for anyone to talk about. But he wrote about it because he couldn't help but write about it. He wrote that in heaven we will know as we are known. And that's exactly what happened to Freddie, that God was speaking to him. But it wasn't like we speak to one another. It was something deep inside his spirit where he knew that God was speaking to him. Freddie experienced the love of Christ, and so did Paul. And Paul wrote about it and said, I'm convinced you know, nothing in the future, nothing in the past, life, death, principalities, powers, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That's because he experienced it. He saw it. And he wanted to share that with you and me. 
Paul Saul also wrote that to die is gain. Live, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He no longer feared death. And he wrote, death, where is your sting? If you want that same experience, I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ will give it to you. All you have to do is ask him for it. Now, Freddie had asked before he died. And so when he died, he was present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's quoting the Bible. He's quoting the Apostle Paul. And both of them experienced the same thing. That can happen to you if you ask Jesus for it. And he doesn't want you to wait to experience death to experience him. He wants to come to you now where you are. And he says very clearly, very plainly in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. You can be that anyone. All you have to do is open the door, and you'll realize that Jesus has been looking for you all along. He loves you with that same infinite love that Freddie experienced, and he wants to bring that to you and bring it to you today, not some far off time, not some time in heaven, but right now. Now, how do you get it? It's a very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're there, if you love me, if all of this is true, will you show me? Will you show up for me? Will you be my Savior today? And if you pray that with all of your heart, the Bible says that you'll find him, that he'll come to you, that he'll forgive you of anything that you've done wrong. He's taken care of all of that for you. Jesus said very plainly, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven. He loves you so much that he paid the price for all your sins, all your mistakes, all your shortcomings, so that you can be with him for all eternity. Now, if this is for you, if this is what you want, do something very simple. Bow your head, humble yourself, and come to him and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Will you save me today? If you want this, don't turn away. Let today be the day you find the assurance that when you die, when you're absent from your body, you'll be present with Jesus for all eternity. Pray with me. Jesus. That's right. Just say it out loud. Jesus. I come to you and I hear these stories. I hear how you want to save me. I hear that you love me. So Jesus, I want you. I want you in my heart. I want you in my life. So come into my heart. Forgive me of the things that I've done wrong. Make me new again. And Jesus, let me know how much you love me. I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for an outpouring of your love. I ask that you fill them and surround them with a love that never passes away and give them the assurance that you will never leave them, you will never forsake them, and they will be with you for all eternity. I ask it. I ask it in the name above all names, Jesus, your only begotten Son. Hear my prayer, for I pray it. In his name, amen. The Bible says that if you'll believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Do what the others have done in this video and let people know that Jesus has saved you. I want you to take the first step in that and call a toll-free number. It's on the screen, 1-800-759-0700. There'll be somebody on the other end of that line. 
They're not there to condemn you. They're not tell, there to tell you how big of a sinner you are. You are. They tell you that God loves you and he's grateful for what you have just done. And we also have a free packet for you. And what do Christians believe? What are the foundations of the faith? When the troubles of life come our way, what do we cling to? It's called a new day and it's free for the asking. Numbers toll free. Call us. Let us know that you've made a decision for Jesus Christ and we'll send it out to you free of charge. God bless you.